think you don't need an interpreter. Well, love that dog that. Bula, bula, bula. As the year 1996 begins to come to a close, things are going great for World Championship Wrestling as we are in the throes of the first act of the New World Order saga. Attendance rates are up, ratings are on the rise, merchandise sales of course going through the roof with the NWO shirt. So things are very much clearly good for this storyline at this point. We have not reached the point of oversaturation or jumping the shark or any of that. But at this point we are about to embark on the most pivotal point of Act 1 of the NWO angle as we reach the end of Sting Timber. Time for us to look at WCW Fall Brawl 1996 War Games from September 15th at the Lawrence Joel Coliseum in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This show was nominated by Emma Bond and Stephen Emanuel over at patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret. At this point, the NWO has truly taken over. Hogan turned in July at Bash the Beach, won the title one month later at Hogwild to face the world championship with the spray paint, and then the question became who would the fourth member of the NWOB as we head toward the War Games match at Fall Brawl. Well, on an episode of Nitro, we began to get some answers. First, when Ted DiBiase showed up, we would find out he was the financial backer of the NWO. And then the week after DiBiase appears, the giant turns on the Dungeon of Doom and becomes the newest member. The funniest part, though, is after that moment, the giant gets on the headset mic because the NWO has taken over the announce desk like they've often done. And the giant begins to tell the story of how he took a trip to to Hulk Hogan's house, and that's how he was swayed by the power of money and the NWO and everything. He's telling this big story, that w which is his motivation for his big betrayal, but Hulk Hogan interrupts him in the middle of it and wraps the promo up for them, and then after he's done talking, the giant keeps trying to tell the story. Man, I stood down at a table. So as the NWO is running roughshod, we have Sting and Lex Luger making an arrangement with the Horsemen. They say that since they also have War Games history, that Sting and Luger should fight alongside Flair and Arn instead of the other two Horsemen. So the partnership is formed. Then on the Go Home Nitro, Lex Luger is assaulted by a man purported to be Sting out in the dark and the rain. It's a betrayal the announced team is putting over with the seriousness of a close loved one having just died. How could he? How could Sting, who is considered the vanguard of WCW, the one guy who at this point has never left the company who's WCW through and through. How could he do this and take DiBiase's money like this? Well, we'll get our answers to that in a little bit. One more thread in the story sees WCW referee Nick Patrick making a lot of controversial calls that all seem to benefit the NWO and hurt the WCW guys, and so his integrity is being called into question. I like the fake out they do in the build where he's chased out of the arena. Looks like he's going to dive into the NWO limo, but he actually runs somewhere else, just keeping the mystery alive. So I have to admit, I've never actually watched any of the build or Fall Brawl 96 before this stuff. You know, I came into wrestling a year and change after this in 1998, so I missed really the peak of the NWO during their rise. I'd seen, you know, WWE's documentary about the NWO, and so I got a bit of a glimpse of it, and I've read, you know, the, the brief synopsis of what happens in this, in this uh, arc, but I've never actually seen it with my own eyes. And so, removing all of the hindsight and kind of thinking of what you know happens with the NWO in the long term, just watching this stuff for the first time and putting myself in that mindset of a kind of a relatively new wrestling fan, like, this is some really entertaining stuff. This storyline and the mystery and the entry has all been really well done at this point. Like the, co the combination of, you know, Eric Bischoff and Kevin Sullivan and Dusty Rhodes all kind of working together for the creative and building this angle so far has been just expertly done. And I'm, you know, again, again, knowing what's happening or what's kind of ahead, but also kind of like shutting that part of my brain out. It's fun to sit and watch these shows week to week and kind of revel in the intrigue and the mystery of what's going on. 11,300 folks at the arena tonight, 230 30,000 pay-per-view buys, way up from 95,000 the previous year, earning the show a .65 buy rate. Tony Schiavone, Dusty Rhodes, and Bobby Heenan on commentary. I love the opening spiel by Heenan here, putting over the horsemen and their history in war games. He says the NWO could see its last wrestling match, and they say it's a war like never before. Great stuff. 
Opening matchup sees Diamond Dallas Page taking on a young Chavo Guerrero Jr. here. Chavo fighting for the honor of his uncle Eddie, who was out of action for the time being because Eddie and DDP had been feuding over the Battle Bull ring. DDP taking Eddie out of action, so Chavo looking for revenge here. Page immediately gets tied up in the ropes, taking a drop kick and a tumble to the outside. Chavo producing a strap from somewhere and whipping Page with it. The referee's letting all this go. At one point in the matchup, when one of the announcers references Eddie, uh, you hear Bobby Heenan jump in saying, Nelson Eddie, and I had to look up who that was because I didn't get the reference, and it's, uh, it turns out Nelson Eddie was like a show tunes singer in the 40s and 50s and in movies. He died in 1967, and the fact that Bobby Heenan just had that reference, like ready to go, at the mere mention of someone saying Eddie, I thought was pretty phenomenal. That feels like very much like an RJ City kind of reference today. DDP falls into the ropes again, but plays possum, allowing Chavo to make a mistake, and DDP takes over. Big flying clothesline to a big response from the crowd. DDP is the heel in this matchup, but the fans are loving him regardless. Page at one point just throwing Chavo backward over his shoulder. DDP suddenly doing this pelvic thrust in Chavo's face, which is weird, but Chavo fights back. Page slips on a banana peel. Guerrero begins to fire off. Page cuts him off, throws Chavo from one ring to the next, and they just fight in that ring now. That's unique. Guerrero with a lot of close calls. DDP catches him with a big old power bomb and a very close kick out. Page counters out of the backslide, hits my face favorite move on the planet, the diamond cutter for the win. Four stars out of five on this one. I was like, you know, I might rate this kind of high, but I just loved what I saw in this one. You know, I think this match had everything. There was a bit of comedy in there. I think there was some good back and forth. Going over to the other ring and just continuing the match onward, I thought was pretty entertaining. So yeah, I was very pleased with this opening matchup. In the CompuServe web zone, we've got Harlem Heat, Sister Sherry, and Colonel Parker harassing the web guy. And then we go to Mean Gene with a special report video package all about the NWO's hostile takeover, the agreement between Horseman and Sting and Luger, Sting's alleged betrayal. I love this stuff. Up next, a whole lot of beef in the ring as Ice Train with Teddy Long takes on Scott the Flash Norton in a submission match. Fire and Ice were a tag team at one point but have since broken up. Not the first two guys I would come up with when trying to make a submission match, but the two actually do have submissions that are getting over. Scott Norton has the flashback, which is the arm bar, and then Ice Train has the full Nelson. Train goes for a splash, but Norton moves and hits a DDT. These guys are trying to trade submissions, make the other submit here into the house mic. Train brings him down, trying to go for a camel clutch, but Scott slips out. Big arm bar locked in. Teddy Long gets on the apron at one point with his towel. Ice goes for a press of some kind, but Norton catches him and slams him down, puts him into a Boston Crab and back to the arm bar. Long's back up on the apron a couple more times. Norton finally has enough and grabs him, but Ice Train with the cheap shot, then locks in the full Nelson. Norton taps out and Ice Train wins. I give it one and a half stars out of five. I like the power on display between these two guys. I love matches like this where it's two powerhouses just colliding into each other. That stuff was fun, but then when they tried to get into the submissions, I wasn't very much into it, and you could tell the fans weren't very much either. So, you know, it was kind of a boring match until that finish happened when Long keeps getting up on the apron. Mike Tanay has joined the announced team to give us some Lucha Con context as we go to the Mexican Heavyweight Championship match, Conan defending against Juventud Guerrera. Conan, who does not not come out with the belt, has changed up his look and has joined the Dungeon of Doom now. Young Juventud, a recently debuted star for WCW, and look at him trip on the steps on the way to the ring. Poor kid. Conan picks up Hoovy and just throws him out of the ring. Hoovy responds with a triple jump from ring to ring into a rolling dive. Holy crap. Tope to the outside. He leaps off the railing, goes for a Hurricane Rana, but Conan power bombs him on the floor. Jimmy Hart going, Arriba La Raza, baby! Ha 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 Oh my god, that woman in the front row is getting so in into this one. Conan continues the heat on Hoovy, going from one ring to the next. An attempt was made. Another dive off the top rope by Hooventude. K Dog just back body drops Hoovy into the other ring ropes and power bombs him back in. My lord. Fighting moves to the outside apron. Hoovy trying to go for a sunset power bomb off the shoulders for Pete's sake, but Conan stops it, hits a drop kick off the apron. Hooventude putting Conan on the turnbuckle. Unnecessary backflip, then takes a drop kick. That was smart. Conan catches a wheel arrow attempt and just flings him onto his back. Hoovy responds with a somersault leg drop. Conan's in the ropes in the pinfall and Hoovy just yells, Shit! 
a 450 splash followed by a tornado splash. Both are somehow kicked out of. Conan catching Hoovy hits the Alabama slam. A nasty looking muscle buster by Conan. Hits what's called the power drop. This looks like a razor's edge with some extra juice and finally wins. I give it three and a half stars out of five. There were some really fun moments in this matchup here, but there were also a lot of uh, chaotic moments and some slip ups leading to some of those great moments as well. And so also there were points in the match I thought kind of dragged um, when you didn't have some of those big things happen, kind of put the crowd uh, to sleep for a bit. But besides that, it was still a solid match. In a match I feel like just reviewed a few weeks ago, it's time for a match between the two Chris's, Benoit of the Horseman and Jericho making his WCW pay-per-view debut. Jericho debuted on Nitro a couple of weeks before this, making his WCW foray, and he's booked as a very much a white meat babyface in this one. It's almost when you look at like, when you do put hindsight into account with Jericho, seeing him in this phase as this plucky young babyface who always wants to win the right way, it's really funny to see that evolution just like a year or two later, because here in his first match against Alex Wright on Nitro, he's got the matchup won by Countout after Alex seems to hurt himself, but Jericho's like, no, no, I don't want to win that way, so just throw the match out entirely and so man what a dork the two start things out intensely the announcers bring up the history these two have pre WCW Benoit getting big cheers for everything in horseman country Benoit putting Jericho in the lion tamer Jericho comes back hits his triangle drop kick then what I think is a triangle back elbow but the bump looks horrible how does he not dislocate his shoulder there Jericho goes yeah and gets booed nice suplex but Benoit's legs are in the ropes Jericho tries to suplex Benoit out of the ring but it's blocked and he gets tossed tossed out himself, my stars and garters. Benoit hitting one of the biggest diving headbutts I've ever seen, and we get a two count. The physical action continues in and outside the ring. Jericho with some pinfall attempts, Benoit keeps kicking out. The tombstone is countered and Benoit is dropped. Chris goes for the lion salt, sees the miss coming, and hits a clothesline. Dusty saying on commentary, Jericho's gonna be a big star in WCW. Well, Dust was half right. Jericho's crotch on the top turnbuckle, big back suplex off the top by Benoit, and the Crippler wins. Four stars out of five for me on this one. It's a damn good matchup here. And Jericho being so new in WCW, this is a great showcase for him here. Only three weeks into his time on TV and everything. And with him and Benoit having that history, they've got a great chemistry here. And it really just showcases both of them excellently. And so it's a great sign of things to come for the future of this rivalry through the years. The great mid-card action continues in a match with the WCW Cruiserweight title as Rey Mysterio defends against Triple A's Super Cal. Tanae is back in the booth here, starting out with some fast-paced back and forth. Mysterio with an advantage until Kahlo bounces right off the top rope and hits a powerbomb. Kahlo dives off the top turnbuckle, hits a missile drop kick on the floor, then follows up with a freaking senton to the outside on the floor. Yuck. Back in the ring, Kahlo with a top rope twisting head scissors, bending Ray backward with the surfboard stretch. Mysterio collides into Kahlo. Bit of help from the referees needed to get the challenger over the top rope. Mysterio comes back with a dive. A springboard by Ray intercepted in midair. Big ol' Frankensteiner off the apron by Ray here. A couple of springboard dives by the champion. Callow goes for a drop kick but misses. Ray leaps from rope to rope into a Frankensteiner pin, covers and wins to retain. I also give this one four stars out of five, and I tell you what, about a minute into this matchup, there's some asshole in the crowd who you can hear yell boring. He was definitely proven wrong by the end of this matchup here. Just more of that great cruiserweight action at its finest in WCW on display. These two showed off some tremendous athleticism, and some of the stuff these guys are doing on the outside just makes my jaw drop every time, you know, especially when you see how thin those mats and how small they are too on the outside. Tony Schiavone prefaces the next matchup by saying, all that stuff you just saw in the last match, yeah, you're not gonna see it here. It's for the WCW Tag Team Championship as Harlem Heat, who are accompanied by Sister Sherry and her main squeeze and Colonel Parker, defend against the Nasty Boys. Fists are flying from the get-go. We get a bit of a standoff on the outside after Sherry grabs Jerry's leg. Big nasty chant from the crowd here. Knobs and sacks are clubbering Stevie Ray in the corner. The Nasties just lay into Booker T for a while as Sherry screams about the officiating. They want to take Booker to Pity City, but Martel gets involved, allowing for Stevie Ray to hit the cheap shot. Big kick to the mush from Stevie to Knobs. Now Sister Sherry on the outside getting some shots in. Sags chasing her through the ring at one point. Jerry gets the tag in, goes on a big run against the champs. He finally gets his hands on Sherry and brings her into the ring as Dusty shouts, Come in here, my little fried pie! Hits a pile 
driver goes up top, but Colonel Parker trips him up. Sags stalks the Colonel, but Stevie just whomps him on the outside. Axe kicked by Booker, and everyone else beats up Sags on the outside. Jerry driving both opponents' heads into the mat, tagging in Nobs. Nasties look real strong all of a sudden. Nobs with a splash on Booker just as Parker distracts the ref. Sherry hitting Nobs with Colonel Parker's cane, the three count, and the win. Three and a half stars out of five for me. I thought there was another solid match on this show. A good blend of the physicality and the athleticism from both teams here. I think the managers, the dual managers on the outside really helped the Nasties look like world beaters during that comeback. Mike Tenay backstage with the Macho Man Randy Savage sporting a Nitro-themed top and his WrestleMania 9 cowboy hat. He calls himself the evil necessity of WCW in the fight against the NWO. He's been thinking, thinking, thinking about what he's going to do to the Giant tonight. He wants to beat him and send a message to the NWO as he also looks ahead to Halloween Havoc in the title match against Hollywood Hogan. We go to that matchup now as Randy Savage takes on the Giant. This match took on a whole new meaning a couple weeks ago when Giant turned and joined the NWO. But before that, the match had already been made because Savage was pissed at the Giant for losing the title at Hogwild and dropping the ball in the fight against the NWO. Giant comes out to the Dungeon of Doom's music at first, which is clearly a botch because they switched to the NWO theme partway through. Nick Patrick is the ref in this match. The announcers immediately point out the sketchiness of that fact. On the outside, Savage trying to slam the Giant, but he just gets flattened on the floor. Giant clubbing away at the Macho Man, picking him up and slamming him with the greatest of ease. Savage fighting out of a bear hug with a good old-fashioned eye gouge. He goes for the legs, brings him down after jumping off the top rope. Still not enough. He gives him the big body slam finally, hits the big elbow as Hollywood Hogan shows up. Lures him to the stage where the outsiders show up and give him a three-on-one beat Nick Patrick oblivious to all of this as Savage's lifeless body is pushed back into the ring. Giant with the cover and the win. I'll give it two stars out of five. This feels like another one of those like angles disguised as a match here. And I think it does its job of like building up that heat between Savage and Hogan going toward Halloween Havoc. But it does make the Giant look really weak considering he is, uh, you know, arguably the strongest and certainly the biggest of all four members of the NWO. He still needs the most help to win. The cage is briefly stuck as we hear from the Horseman and Lex Luger, whose hair looks like shit for some reason. Which Horseman will replace Sting in the War Games match? Flair does not answer that question, but he does call Mike Tenay Gene. Sting enters the room and everyone's mad at him, Sting pleading it wasn't him who turned on Luger last week, but Lex saying he doesn't believe him and says he looked into his eyes and knew, which in hindsight makes him look like a big fucking idiot. Also, how has Sting made no attempt to contact Luger in the six days since Nitro went down? No phone call or anything? Sting says so be it and says he'll see them outside. It is now time for that War Games match as the NWO take on Team WCW. Michael Buffer laying down the rules for the match, surrender or submission only. He says the fourth man in Team NWO will be named later and that the fourth man for Team WCW is not and may not even be selected. Scott Hall and Arn Anderson start the match match here, Dusty pointing out that Arn has been the starter for nearly every War Games match in history up to that point. Next man in five minutes later from the NWO, it's Kevin Nash, and the two-on-one advantage immediately becomes an issue for Arn. Lex Luger shows up before his time is officially up, but fuck it, he's the babyface. Up next is Hollywood Hogan, the champ. He gets bullied by Luger and Arn to a big pop, but that's snuffed out. Hogan drops the leg onto Arn, and soon in comes Ric Flair to a tremendous pop, and now the teams are evened back up. Hearing Dusty root for Flair and Arn after all the history those three have had in war games is absolutely like weird to hear, but I'm totally for it. Flair goes for Hogan, hits him with a foreign object, hitting Nash with a low blow, dick kicks City to Hall. We get the strut. Who's the NWO's fourth man? And oh no, it appears to be Sting, even though it takes all of two seconds to look at that guy and realize that is not Sting. Now granted, Jeff Farmer's physique is actually really similar and really close to Steve Borden's, but they made a fatal mistake in showing his face there. Now they did a good job covering up the, you know, you didn't see Sting's face in that backstage segment there, and you should have not been able to see the Sting's face all that clearly here. To their credit, once he got in the ring, you never saw a close-up of his face, but they should have kept that going from when he comes out of the curtain onward, like show him like behind his shoulder or something where you don't quite see it, to keep the mystique going, because you do hear some fans chanting, we want Sting, because even they can tell it's not the same guy. The face and the hair are just not the same. Then out comes number four for WCW, the real Sting. He was telling the truth. Sting's on fire, beats up everyone by himself, 
himself. Then he asks Lex that that's good enough for him, tells him to stick it, and he leaves. NWO Sting puts the Scorpion Deathlock on Luger. Hogan getting the hold as well. Referee Nick Patrick calls it for the NWO. Luger crawling up the ramp, screaming for the Stinger to help as the beating continues. Randy Savage comes out and goes after Hogan, corners him in the ring. The Giant flattens him. Miss Elizabeth shows up trying to protect Macho Man. Hogan spray paints her back. Giant barks at her like a dog for some reason. Hogan berates them both on the mic and he spits on Liz. Shivani calling Hogan the lowest wrestler that's ever walked on the face of the earth. The NWO continues to celebrate in the ring. They beat up Savage for several minutes as garbage is thrown in by the audience. The announced team's completely shell-shocked at what they've witnessed. They're chased off by the NWO, who close out the show. DiBiase says he wants all the demands he asked for to be honored. They want tag titles. They want their own show. They want their own pay-per-view. They want the trip to space camp. They want the jet ski. They want the living room furniture set. They want a million new members that will dilute the brand to the point of parody. They want Jeff Jarrett. And brother, they're going to get all that and more. Once again, this is an angle disguised as a match. The in-ring action for this one is not going to compare to the drama you would see once you go into the match beyond in other iterations of War Games. That's not what this is about. It's about the story of Sting, his, his feelings being hurt by the lack of trust from other WCW wrestlers, and that twist of the fake Sting being revealed as, even though they kind of botched it a little bit, still a very good twist just from an execution standpoint and like showing that Sting was telling the truth and now he has like no allegiance because he's obviously not Team NWO, but he's also not Team WCW at this point. So like whose side is he on? That is an answer we're not going to really get for many, many more months. This is the beginning of Sting's 18-month absence from the ring before Starcade 97. And of course, how that all gets resolved is, well, certainly another story which I've talked about at length in other videos. My grade for WCW Fall Brawl 96 is an A-. minus. This is an excellent excellent show. I mean, most if not all of the mid card is really entertaining and action packed. The main event, you know, it's light on action but big on story and that's what was really driving so much of the success of WCW at this time was the storytelling of the NWO and their takeover. Like I said, they have not jumped the shark yet. They have not gotten absolutely ridiculous like it's still a logical storyline that we have seen here. I mean, logical to a point. Giant joining the group so soon after he got beat for the title still kind of weird, but everything else feels relatively logical, and the stuff with Sting at the end, you know, figuring out where his allegiances lie, and not knowing at this point he's going to be gone for a year and a half, and that's absolutely crazy to think about back then, but that's where things are going, but everything up to this point and this show here is just a great capping off of this first portion of what would go on to be this longer story arc for the NWO. It's really peak WCW around this time. And with that, that is going to wrap up our month of Sting Timber coverage. But what did you think of Fall Brawl 96? I want to hear about that in the comments below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. In two weeks, we are back here on the Classic Review, looking at an October classic in No Mercy 2002. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.